Uh, I'm Sean Parent. I'm a senior principal scientist at Adobe Systems and uh, just restarted the Adobe Software Technology Lab, uh, which is very exciting for me. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so for anybody who doesn't know, uh, Dave Abrahams has, has uh, joined my group and David Senkel. Uh, has also joined my group. And there's a fourth person who is not here, and that's Nick DeMarco. He just started this week. But I suspect you guys will be getting to know him better in the future. Uh, uh, so it's a great small team. Um, uh, so this talk is exception handling the other way around. And I got to pull out a chair here. Sit down, get down at your level for a minute. <laughs> so this is not one of my better code series of talks. This is a parental talk, <laughs> okay? That's a capital P, TM. <laughs> so here's the issue. I've been hearing a lot lately about people experimenting with exceptions. There's talk about a stood expected. People have been playing around with boost outcome. And I understand it. You guys are all maturing as developers. Okay, sometimes you don't even know what your code is doing anymore. Right? Occasional misuses of std optional, really? Oh, std error code, yeah, okay. Defer, I've seen people playing with this idea. And there's still some kids on the corner handing out air nose. So <laughs> just say no to the air nose. <laughs> okay. So I understand all of, all of this. I do. You guys, you all, you went to your scrum meeting. You stood up in front to give your demo. You're very nervous. And then it happened. The unexpected exception. Right? It's very embarrassing. But it happens to all of us. Okay? It's OK. We're going to get through this together. Right, so a very pixelated picture. That's me. Uh, that's an article I, I wrote now 30 years ago. So, so that's 1992, living in an exceptional world. So I wrote this uh, 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 while I was at Apple. It's really not, it's not C++. The, the article is written in C. Uh, it does mention C++, and it was a little bit influenced by the ideas in C++. And at this point in time, I was a bit obsessed with exceptions. Okay. Now, I hardly even think about exceptions anymore. So this talk came about because the topic of exceptions came up inside of an internal or on an internal Adobe Slack list. And the response from several of the engineers, both senior and junior engineers, was, I hate exceptions. Could we just get rid of exceptions? One engineer described this as a bullet firing through his code, doing, you know, leaving collateral damage everywhere, right? So I didn't understand, right? right? I didn't understand where this attitude around exceptions came from because I wrote, I wrote this article. Uh, John Kalb has uh, given many talks on exception handling. I updated first Photoshop, and then I helped the Acrobatter, Illustrator, and InDesign team move to C++ exception handling. Okay, so I had gone through it with major products. I understood the benefits. Uh, uh, Dave Abrahams had, has, has written uh, papers and articles and given talks on this. And yet somehow, exceptions still seem to be a mysterious thing. And so reflecting on, on on why I don't even think about them anymore is what led to this talk. Okay, uh, uh, that article that I just mentioned uh, is is cited here. Uh, if you have a Macintosh, uh, you can open up a cert macros.h on your machine. It will be installed with Xcode, and I assume anybody in this room who has a Mac has Xcode installed. Uh, and it cites my article, Living in an Exceptional World, and it has a couple of links. I think one of them is dead, but one of them will still work. Um, uh, and this was a set of macros for handling exceptions in C. 
I used the wonderful macro names, check and require, all lowercase. <laughs> uh, so for about 20 years after doing this, I got bug reports by email. Long after I had left Apple, I would get People would just email me bug reports. Would you please, you know, use like macro names that are sane because you broke my build. In 30 years, there's only been one year, and that's during this pandemic, that I haven't been made aware of breaking somebody else's build with my macros. At one point, this was so bad, I actually sent a legal looking cease and desist letter to Apple because the magazine article doesn't mention that I'm an Apple developer and it lists these under my own copyright. And somebody in Apple's legal department actually researched the issue and sent me back a notice saying that when I wrote, wrote this code, I was an employee at Apple and therefore they had all rights to it. So now at least you can optionally turn these macros off. So uh, 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 hopefully after 30 years, this will die down. So, you know, may all your code be used for 30 years. So what's an error? We need to understand that. C++ exceptions are just one of the many possible forms of error handling. Right? To understand exceptions, we first need to, to understand what an error is. Right? To do that, we have to understand that every operation has a set of preconditions. We're going to talk more about preconditions, but for right now, they're just a logical assertion. When the preconditions are satisfied, that's very important. When the preconditions are satisfied, an operation must either complete successfully, satisfying its post conditions, or yield an error with an indication as to why the post condition could not be satisfied. Yield we got to fix that on the slide is a bad choice of, uh, of words here because it means so much in so many different languages, but just return an error. It needs to return an error or throw an exception or something. Okay. So there's a logically isomorphic system to this where post conditions include the error state. Okay. But that gets very tedious to think about, right? But the important point here is that errors are about post conditions, right? And people think errors are about preconditions. Preconditions relate to post conditions. Errors are about post conditions. The ideas of pre and post conditions come from Bertrand Myers and Design by Contract. Uh, the original version of this paper was from 1986. The paper shown, I think, was a republication in 92. I've never been able to get a copy of the original. I even sent a note to Bertrand and no reply. So if anybody knows him or has a contact, I would love a copy of the original paper. Um, uh, design by contract is primarily about preconditions, postconditions, and class invariants. So let's dig into a precondition a little more. A precondition is an assertion that must be true before an operation. Usually when we're using it, what we're talking about is the arguments to the function, but it also applies to the state of the machine. Okay. So for example, sort, if we have a function sort first, last, in some comparison, we're going to have a set of preconditions on this, that the range first to last is a valid range, implying that first is less than or equal to last. That for all p in the range first to last, p is dereferenceable. Right? It's a half open interval there, so we can't dereference at end. For all p, we'll let v equal to the set of values star p. And for all pairs, V, A, V, B, compare as a predicate establishing a strict weak order. Okay. There are more preconditions, but this gives you an idea. This is a set of preconditions around sort. Okay. There's a lot of confusion here. The domain of an operation is the set of values satisfying the precondition. The domain of a function in C or C++ is not the argument type. 
It's the set of values that satisfy the precondition. And that's an important thing to understand. So let's talk a little bit about postconditions. A postcondition is assertion that must be true just after an operation. Now, a lot of times in documentation, you'll see, oh, you know, returns P and then postcondition. Okay. The postcondition there is usually describing side effects. And, but the returns part is also a postcondition in our calculus. So we're talking about both the function result and the side effects of the function. Both of those are included in the postconditions. Okay, unless there's an error, right? Remember, we're carving error out of here. We're gonna come back to carving error out of here because uh, we need to say something more about the system when there is an error for the system to be correct. So the post condition of sort is that all the elements in the range first last are in non-decreasing order as defined by the comparison function. Okay, that's our post condition of sort. Class invariance. Class invariance are post conditions that hold for all operations on a type. Okay. So, as such, class invariance also act as preconditions. Okay. And they don't have to be explicitly stated. So, when do we report an error? An error is appropriate when a post condition cannot be satisfied. Okay. An error is a recoverable event. If an error is not a recoverable event, just call terminate. Terminate your application at that point. Programming errors are not recoverable events because you can't tell where they came from. Okay. Okay. Throw any logic error or anything derived from a logic error should really be a call to terminate. Most of the calls that are throw runtime error should really be a call to terminate. Okay, so why would we throw, why would we return an error or throw an exception? Some common things, resource exhaustion. How do we deal with out of memory? IO failures, these are external failures on our system. Validating external, external data, where it would take as much effort to pre-validate the thing as it would to parse the information out of it, that would be an appropriate case to throw an exception. Cancellation, okay? So this could be user cancellation. If you're running Photoshop, you hit command period. Photoshop actually throws an exception when you hit command period on the keyboard to halt the, whatever operation is going, okay? It's not an interrupt thing, but we set an atomic bool and periodically, when we're processing, we look at that atomic bool, and if it's true, we throw an exception. Okay. This could also be cancellation just because in the course of your application, you no longer re need a result, right? So, so it, it comes up fairly often in other domains. Uh, the other thing is implementation and representation limits can be a good thing, especially where the implementation and representation limits are not things that you could that you could expect the caller of your function to be able to, to validate in advance with the precondition, right? So errors tend to happen at a low level, okay? Operator new is sitting down at the bottom somewhere here, right? So not always at the bottom, sometimes in the middle of the chain, but the bulk of them happen low down, down in the chain. And these are your stack calls here. This is main calling through some stack, and then it returns, and then it goes down another path. So all of these downward threads here are your stack chains. So set a breakpoint in one of a real application sometime and see how long that stack is. And you get an idea of how far an error might propagate and all the things that could be along that path. Okay, these can be very long chains. So I want to hammer down two key points. Errors tend to occur at a low level, and a significant amount of code may be in that path. So, we have to say one more thing about preconditions. When preconditions are not satisfied, what happens? Anybody? 
Well, that's a bug. Okay. An operation may lead to undefined behavior. The result may be unspecified and may violate class invariance. It may lead to program termination. Undefined behavior, hopefully everybody here has a good understanding of what un undefined behavior, but undefined behavior is corrupt memory, data races, crashes, absolutely anything. Okay, launch the missiles, kill the family dog. Okay, the reason why undefined behavior is like that is because the once your compiler has gotten past static checking, the compiler assumes that undefined behavior can't happen. The compiler is allowed to freely assume the correctness of your application and optimize accordingly. And you can do some quick ser Google searches to find out what that can lead to. It can lead to invoking functions in your application that would otherwise be unreachable, for example. Okay. Unspecified behavior is a little bit narrower. This could be an infinite loop, a corrupt value. Okay. It could be terminate. So let's talk a little bit about safety. So this is a different definition on safety than I've given in some of my talks. Uh, uh, Dave and I have been refining this definition and I think we've settled at a point that I'm very happy with here. So, so if you're watching one of my other talks and I talk about safety and the definition of safety, just cross that out and refer to this talk. Okay. So. An operation is safe if it cannot lead to undefined behavior. Directly or indirectly, even if the operation preconditions are violated. Okay. That's our definition of a safe op operation. Okay. A safe operation may lead to unspecified behavior, but it cannot lead to undefined behavior. Put another way, an unsafe operation may lead to undefined behavior if preconditions are violated, either directly or during subsequent operations, safe or not, right? Which means once you've made, once you've violated a precondition on an unsafe operation, your machine can crash at any point in the future. That's what that means. Okay. Or kill the family dog. My, uh, my favorite example of that is corrupting the heat. Yes. You corrupt the heat here and 10 minutes later you're you're staring at the steaming wreckage of your program yep so the comment was favorite example is heap corruption which we've probably all experienced go is ahead john to say that a function that has no preconditions is safe uh a function that has no no preconditions yes would be considered safe if you're okay. if you they cannot be violated so safe functions have wide contracts yes so safe functions have wide contracts no? no? You disagree? You, you can't violate a precondition, so it can't be unsafe. No, you can be safe by terminating. Uh, that still, though, I would, I would consider that outside the precondition. That would be a precondition violation, because we didn't exactly. return an error or fulfill a contract. Exactly. It's outside the precondition. It's a precondition violation. That means the contract is narrow. But our, so but, but our precondition is true. Our precondition is wide. So, so no, yeah. The, the, statement, right. the statement was, if a, Safe functions have wide contracts, and that is not true. Is there a oh. How about wide <laughs> functions are safe? Wide functions are safe would be the way to phrase that. Well, if, they're, mm -hmm. if they're completely wide. Right, which is what he said, if they're completely that wide. That was not the last thing he said. That was not the late thing. <laughs> <laughs> I agreed with the first part of his statement. So the conversation for the video going on here is exactly how to phrase this. An operation that has no preconditions is safe by definition because you can't violate the preconditions. Okay, so, 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 and full stop there. Okay. What about a, a bug in the operation? Uh, the operation uh, if your code is incorrect, your code is incorrect, and that usually means that you actually end up violating a precondition somewhere within that operation, and so now you're so you're toasted. To ask, if I have a wide contract that's implemented properly, is it safe? If it's fully wide, if if, if you have wide is, wide is wide. true, is it wide or it isn't? well, no preconditions, then yes, uh, no preconditions is safe. 
Uh, how yep. do you ever push a, white, a, fu a safe function onto a stack? How do you ever push a safe function onto a stack? So, so first of all, there is the safety of the operation of the function itself. And then, because we're talking about safety of operations, so now, now what we're doing is we're talking about the, the safety of the operation of push. I don't know whether or not your, your push operation is safe. You're completing a no fail operation with, with something else. Now, if you allocate any resource at all in your function, any, that could not be there, then it might not return. It might just blow up the whole thing. Your stack gets over, whatever. <laughs> that you would have to return an error in that case. You if you, then you have a precondition that there's enough memory for this to happen, and then it's not your, by your definition, a wide contract, right? right? Preconditions include the state yeah. of the machine. Yes, preconditions ah, include the state of the machine. Right, right, right. <laughs> Except for in maybe particular constrained embedded yeah, environments. Very, yes. Very constrained. very constrained environments. In general, that is true because we're dealing with machines with multiple processes running and multiple threads running and other things accessing the disk and VM systems. And new probably never even throws to begin with, but that's a whole different topic. Um, uh, uh, so yes. OK, so people got, got this clear at this point? OK. Really? Is it? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I mean, go ahead, Dave. At this point, my my impression is it must be pretty unclear to most people in the room now, with, after all of this argument. So, are 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 people following that? An operation is safe if it cannot lead to undefined behavior, directly or indirectly, even if the operation preconditions are violated. Okay, and let's go on a little bit more because we'll we'll see the ramifications of this. Throwing an exception is certainly defined behavior. That's returning an error result. Well, okay. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Throwing an exception might be undefined behavior. Because undefined behavior can do anything, including throwing an exception. Yes. If there are indeed throwing an exception under certain conditions, is, <laughs> is defined behavior. That, when you, if you guarantee that that's what's happening, then that is defined because you guaranteed it. Yes. yes. Ex, ex, yes, yes, errors and exceptions. We kind of rule them out, and we'll get to that in a minute. But we have to say something about this, out of, about the state of the machine, and we haven't gotten there yet. So what if you're in an environment where terminating is not an option? For example, you're running some kind of medical device. Like how does this definition fit, fit in there? Uh, 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 well, first, we're talking about safety, not directly about, about termination. But if you're doing that, you want a safe system. And we're going to, 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 to get there in a minute, OK? So we refer to an operation that terminates on a precondition violation or has uh, uh, no preconditions, this is to you, John, as being strongly safe. OK? Oh, so terminating is, is part of it. As long as it doesn't return and give you a bad answer, as long as it, it dies, that's within the realm of okay. That is within the realm of strong safety. On some okay. What's that? Then you don't have strong safety no, in that environment. That's not true. You can have operations with no preconditions. You can have operations with mo no preconditions, right? Which would right. would not call terminate and be strong safe. But yes, okay. So you get half of that. You don't get the termination part. That's not Dave the keeps me honest here. <laughs> he thinks faster. I, I do want to ask one question. If you have, if you have one, one at a time, please. Yeah. Wait. Here. There's always a precondition. I think we just said, which is having the suitable. Let, let's let's get there okay. to that. Okay. Okay. Uh, so in any case, safety is about incorrect code. Okay, and the scope of damage it may cause. Right, because as we define safety, right, safety comes into play when we violate a precondition. Errors are about correct code in recoverable situations. I just like, I don't know, avoid doing the operation, for example, 
if, if, the, if, if the precondition is not matched. If the precondition is not matched. And then I jump to wherever else it, in this program instead of terminus. If the precondition is not matched, you can do anything you want. Right. Your code is wrong. OK, if you want safety, no. if, 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 if the preconditions are not matched in a, in a safe system, right. OK, you cannot lead to undefined behavior. Right. But that's you can lead to unspecified values. You can lead to wrong results. You could lead to exceptions getting thrown. You could lead to termination right. if you have termination in your Wait, system. I want to clarify my question because it wasn't exactly what I was referring to. You yeah. said that something is safe if preconditions are not met then you don't, oh, you either terminate or that no preconditions exist, right? That's right. Two. Okay, so I'm asking, instead of terminating, for example, something, can you, do you think that something is safe if instead of terminating, I'm doing something that avoids performing the operation, whatever, and keep running? That, 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 was, my that was my definition of strongly safe. Oh. If you continue running, you might be safe, you might be safe, but you will not meet the definition of strongly safe. The point of strongly safe is, is we're going to catch your mistake and fail fast. That's the point of strongly safe. But what does it, uh, fail fast doesn't have to be terminated. You could reset your, the entire system to its initial state and start over, yeah, and then still fail fast. Uh, that's the definition of terminate. That's the definition of terminate, yeah. Here we go. What I hear, what I hear in Inval's question is, can I, instead of doing what I'm contracted to do by the operator, by the API that I'm trying to satisfy, uh -huh. can I just go do something else instead? And yes, you can do that, and it's it avoids undefined behavior, but your program is still incorrect. Well, yeah, she. You're not going to fulfill your contract. Right, right, right. Which is the idea here? If you violate your precondition, that's a bug. Your code is wrong. Right. Right. Just by, like, <laughs> Okay. <laughs> this bug, your code is wrong. I, I have a question. Like I, I have a, I have a sum. Okay. And okay. that sum is meant to do that for int, whatever. Okay. And if I found out that I got not int but something else. Okay. I just jump to a different sum that actually valid for double, for example. Okay. W would that still mean safe? Operation it depends on what your preconditions are and what your postconditions are, and are you able to to satisfy that contract? So if there's no, when we're talking about safety, we're about talking about what happens when the when the preconditions are violated. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I'm really sure I have a good example. Okay. Root. Yeah. Pass in minus one. Yes. Because it's undefinedly safe, but it must be non-negative. If it passes minus one and it terminates, it's strongly safe. If it returns zero, it's safe. Correct. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So safety is important because safety is a transitive property. Okay. What that means, what, what, what we mean by a transitive property is, is we mean that if the property holds to some part A and also holds to some part B, then it holds to the sequence AB. Okay. That's what it means to have a transitive property. So because safety is a transitive property, that means that we can build a safe language. If we build a language with no undefined behavior, which is, is what, what uh, like Swift uh, tries to be safety by default. It's got an escape patch to get out of safety. Uh, Rust similarly tries to do safety by default. Uh, some languages are pure languages and purely safe. So the reason why you can build those, those languages is because safety is a transitive operation. OK, correctness is not a transitive operation, unfortunately. OK, <laughs> it would be really nice if it was that we could just write a programming language where no matter what you said in it, you got a correct program out. Um, uh, and that's the reason for that is because the way we're defining correctness is top down. We're defining it in terms of preconditions and postconditions, and the precondition is sitting external to the function. If instead you define program correctness, to be, if I've got a correct operation and then I put two correct operations, then this is what those two operations do, and that's correct, right? right I've got an operation with pre and post conditions, and those go together, and I can assemble them in any way, then yes, you can build any system that is correct, but the only definition of that system is from inside out, it's from bottom up, and it just works as coded, okay? 
So under this definition of correctness, it's top down. We don't get transitivity. So strong safety, unfortunately, is not transitive. Okay. Why is that? Do people know? Okay. What if at my bottom level, right, I say I've got operation A is strongly safe, with, which means that if I violate the preconditions on it, it will terminate. Operation B is strongly safe. If I violate the preconditions, it will terminate. And I combine those into some operation C, and then I write a set of preconditions on top. Violating my top preconditions might not violate the preconditions of either item in my sequence. Okay? So strong safety is not transitive, which means that we cannot avoid this uh, 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 undefined behavior okay, argument. That undefined behavior, not, uns not, I'm sorry, not undefined behavior, unspecified behavior. We cannot avoid unspecified behavior. Okay? We can avoid undefined behavior because safety is transitive, but we cannot avoid unspecified behavior. How do you get that conclusion? What's that? How do you get that conclusion? I get that con You didn't lay that out exactly. <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm yeah. you, I just don't understand like, where does that conclusion come from? Well, that conclusion comes from, we know that correctness is not transitive, yeah. okay, which means that now we are either in a, but we know that safety is, so we can be safe, which means we have no undefined behavior. Okay, and, uh, 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 but we can't be just strongly safe, okay, and always terminate. And so what's left is that box of, of undefined behavior. Un saying, thank you, unspecified behavior. I'm going to keep flipping those. Thank you. How, how can correctly written preconditions be less than a superset of the composed operations? Oh, uh, that's <laughs> right. That's, that's very easy because you can put whatever constraint on an operation that you want. Let's say um, I've got, a, we'll see in, in a minute here, I've got a, a container, we'll call it a zip vector, and it contains two vectors inside of it, which are always the same length, right, right which represent pairs go, going up and down. They're always the same length, okay? That's my class invariant, which is a post condition, which says that these things are always the same length. Okay, can I violate that and make one shorter than the other and end up with an object which doesn't satisfy my invariance, which is now corrupt? Yes, I can, right? right? Without violating the invariance on my vectors. Oh. Okay. <laughs> it's very common that it, operation has tighter. Has tighter. Okay. Because you're trying to you're you're trying to create some new meaning right? on yeah. top of those parts. Yeah. That makes sense. Question over here? No, no command. Maybe another more mathematical example. You can build arithmetic just from addition. And so you can build square root from just addition, which was safe and square root is no longer. Right. The the comment here was you can build square root or or you can build mathematics from just just addition, therefore you can build square root from just, just addition, but that doesn't mean that square root of negative one is defined. Okay? So. Um, David. So, let's say you have a function and you check the preconditions using uh, C assert just to assert. Yeah. Is that strongly safe? <laughs> Okay, so the question was, is it strongly safe if you check the preconditions with C assert? Well, the question is first, can you? Um, uh, there are lots of preconditions that you cannot just, just check programmatically, and we'll get to some, some of those later. Um, uh, and are you compiling without any debug flag? But yes, just assert could be a way for you to make something strongly safe. Uh, yes. <laughs> if yeah. the safety of the function depends on that assert. Yes. yes, yes. If the safety of the function depends on that assert. Um, okay, so what is valid? Okay. I'm not going to quite answer this question. Uh, 
but I'm going to put up an example here from C++ with pointers. Okay? So we've got this little piece of code. We've got P, which is initialized to a null pointer, and then it's, it's initialized to be the beginning of, of our int x there. Okay? And at this point where the arrow is, P is valid and dereferenceable. Okay, everybody see that? No questions? Okay, now we can add another statement here where we increment P. P is valid but not dereferenceable. What does that mean? P no longer satisfies the preconditions of the dereferenceable operator, so we would also say P is not in the domain of dereferencing. Okay, star P, if we put it at this point, would be undefined behavior. Could do anything. P down here, it's commented out because I'm not even convinced that I could have just written P semicolon there. Okay? P at this point, see what happened? X fell out of scope. Okay? P was pointing one after X, X fell out of scope. P is invalid, is what we say here. This is spooky action at a distance. P may be assigned to or destructed. That's what the standard says. You can assign to it or you can destruct it. Dereferencing P is undefined behavior. It can launch the missiles and kill your family dog. Okay? All the other operations, including copy and comparisons, are implementation defined behavior and may trap, may call terminate, according to the standard. Okay? And that implementation defined in the standard usually means means there are some set of constraints on the implementation. Like it's implementation defined what the size of size, size t is or what the size of int is, but it has to be, int has to be more than 16 bits, blah, 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 okay? Um, but in this case, I'm not convinced that a compiler implementer couldn't say, maybe Sean would know, um, uh, couldn't come along and say all those other operations are undefined behavior. That's, that's my, my definition as, as, an, as an implementer. Okay, so this contract here. But you would have to document it if you did. What's that? You would have to document it. <laughs> right, right? Means you have to say what happens. Right, so it might as well be undefined behavior, right? Well, right. Because and because the interesting the thing. It's whatever the compiler writer told you, told, told you it could be. And that includes copying, which means I can't pass that pointer somewhere else, right? Questions? John? I have John? a question about if you have a function that takes a const L value reference and you pass in this P now to that function and the function doesn't use its argument. Yeah. You can't pass L value reference to what, to a pointer? Oh, oh, no, yeah, this, this is Dave's question, and, and I don't know. I've got a note to try to dig through the, the standard and figure it out, which is, the question is, if I call some function that takes a reference to P, am I allowed to just take a reference to P? Well, am I, are you allowed to take address of P? Uh, no, you, you definitely, yeah, you definitely cannot take address of P, but are you allowed to pass it to a function taking a reference to P? What's that? Star P. I think you can take the address of it, but that's another point. Yeah. I'm saying if you say star question. P and bind it to a reference, whether it's in a function no, or that, a that's UP. Yeah. That's Yeah. 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 My, here, here's my hypothesis. I, I suspect you're allowed to write a function like make null. Okay. So I suspect you're allowed to write a function like make null that would take p by reference and would null it. So I suspect that that's okay. But looking at the standard, I'm not 100% certain. So if you guys can answer here. All right. That's to be determined. We got to Okay. No, because x is now out of scope. Okay, so it is not just after. Yeah, when we were at plus plus p, p was valid. Now down here, once we fell out of scope. Yes, if I dereferenced above. So that was that was this example. P is valid but not dereferenceable, and star p is undefined behavior. 
The another plus plus is itself undefined behavior. Okay, that might have been. Okay. okay. Yeah. You said P may be assigned to. How do you do the assignment without notionally binding to an L value of a function of an assignment function? Well, so it's a it's a pointer. Yeah, so it's notionally. Yeah, well, notionally doesn't matter to the standard. <laughs> yeah, so the question was notionally how you, how do you do this with a function? I suspect that as we said before, functions are okay. So I suspect that notionally it's okay. Also, I don't know for certain. The other answer could be because it's C plus plus and the compiler allows it. Uh, question over here. If, if like sometime in here I had a conditional, okay, then what's the value of p down here? No, uh, so, so, so the question so, is, uh, is it valid then? Because it depends on runtime value. It, it, it is conditionally valid. Conditionally. Okay, it is conditionally valid. And, but to be clear here, does invalid mean that our invariants are broken? Anybody? No, invalid does not mean invariants are broken. This is all correct code. Right? If we break invariance, our code's incorrect. Dave's like pounds this over my head. If we break invariance, our code's incorrect. Right? Okay. Uh, uh, so our, no invariants are violated here. It doesn't mean our code is incorrect to say that P is invalid. Okay. Uh, it doesn't mean that there are no valid operations on P. Right? I can do this. P equals null pointer. I can assign to it. I can let it fall out of scope and destruct. Okay. Um, okay. So invalid in this sense with pointers, and it's the same with the definition of iterators, by the way. Okay. So something that's invalid, you can only assign to it. Okay. Or destruct it. But all the other operations, no, you cannot. And in the case of a pointer, at this state, there is absolutely no test that I can write in my code to say is p valid or not. Okay? This is a flow-dependent state of our application as to whether or not p is valid. Okay. So this is a paper from 1998, Dave Abrahams. Uh, a little background on, on when I first came across this paper. Uh, uh, I had been working on Photoshop in the very early 90s and uh, uh, saw the STL. There was a little bit about, about a buzz of STL. I started playing with it. I wanted to integrate it into Photoshop, but this was probably uh, 94 maybe, so about four years before this paper came out. And we didn't have a compiler that supported C++ exception handlings yet. At that time, C++ exception handlings weren't particularly well defined. And, um, uh, uh, but we did have our own exception handling system inside of Photoshop based off of set jump, long jump, okay? Which was very cumbersome. You had to register objects on the stack to be, you know, manually. So, so think about it as exception handling, but all of that destructor unwinding stuff is stuff you have to do, do in your code. Um, uh, so in order to use STL, this was the original HP STL inside of our code base, I had to make the original HP STL exception correct using Photoshop's exception handling system. Okay. So I went through, this was actually my first exposure to the STL code and where I realized that the STL code was the work of an absolute genius. Uh, but as I'm going through this code, which had no exception handling in it because Alex ignored the exception handling to begin with. So it didn't have like standard exception handling that I was replacing. It had no exception handling that I was trying to cut in. Uh, and I did it and it worked, but I was never quite sure. Right, right. Did it work correctly? Did it work well? Did I handle all the cases? Was there something I missed? 
So four years later, this paper comes out. Okay, this was at the International Seminar on Generic Programming. And this paper, I recommend you all go read it. It's short. It applies equally to error handling, okay, uh, you know, as well as exceptions. And uh, uh, as a little background, at the point that Dave wrote this, exceptions in C++ were very controversial. Somehow they seem to be becoming controversial again, but there was a 1994 article by C++ Report by Tom Cargill that demonstrated the difficulty of, impl of implementing an exception safe stack. And John concluded that article with, I don't know for sure how many bugs must be correct in stack to make an exception correct. Okay, and John was fairly well respected and an expert and a lot of people saw this as like, well, like, well then exceptions don't work. Okay, and so they were very controversial. You mean Tom, right? I mean Tom. Okay. Tom Cargill. Did I say somebody else? John, John. John. sorry. Looking at John and <laughs> <laughs> blaming him for everything. So, so this paper by Dave Abrahams was in part a response to that. Um, uh, and it lays out the, the rules for exception handling in, in generic systems, but it's really the rules for, for exception handling and error handling in general. So I want to just read the abstract to give you an idea of the scope of this. This paper represents the knowledge accumulated in response to a real world need. And, and it was actually knowledge accumulated. Dave had done the work to, to cut in exception handling and test Yale port. And yeah, and uh, uh, there's some, some interesting articles, kind of precursors to this paper that you can find online on that work. Um, that the C++ standard library exhibit useful and well-defined interactions with exceptions. The error handling mechanism built into the new C++ core language. It explores the meaning of exception safety, reveals surprising myths about exceptions and gener genericity, describes valuable tools for reasoning about program correctness, and outlines an automated testing procedure for verifying exception safety. Okay, that's pretty good for a short paper. In this paper, Dave talks about myths. And one of the myths was, it's almost as though exceptions are viewed as a mysterious attack on otherwise correct code. Remember I said, like a couple weeks ago, an engineer at Adobe says, it's like a bullet firing through my code. This myth still exists, okay? From which we must protect ourselves. Needless to say, that doesn't lead to a healthy relationship with error handling. So what does Dave lay out? He lays, lays out the guarantees for exception handling. Hopefully everybody here has seen these. We have the basic exception guarantee, okay? We haven't defined what guarantee means yet, but for right now we're gonna say it means the English word. It's actually a, a term of trade, okay? But we're gonna just, just take it as the English word, it's close enough. So the basic exception guarantee means invariance hold. We've already talked about invariance. The values of objects being modified are otherwise unspecified. That's what it says. There's the strong exception guarantee, which means that the state of the machine is restored to the state prior to the failing operation. That means that if you had a valid iterator, it's still valid, or a valid pointer, it's still valid, okay? So you can't even have spooky action at a distance and obey the strong safety guarantee. So the invariants of your system hold by extension. And then there's the no exception guarantee. Like you could still allocate some OSMX memory, for example. Yeah, we're talking about logical state, not physical state. So if it's not observable, yeah. as if. Sorry, Dave. Dave. Uh, sorry. So the way, the way that's dealt with in this theory is that the exception guarantee is the guarantee that the Yeah, his, it, yeah, his, 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 his question wasn't, yeah. does it leak? It's, yeah, it it's, it's, could you obey the strong exception guarantee and, and have allocated a block and deallocated a block? Or, or, or and, allocated no, just, and not deallocated. Could you have, yet, could you have extra capacity? As defined, no, you could not. No, you could not. Capacity, the observable state of the system has to be the same. Okay. Right, okay. Okay, so it's a really strong guarantee. I still maintain that the observable state of the system could be different if you can no longer allocate something because you have fragmentation. 
because of something that happened as a result. The state of the system changed, and you can't observe it, but we can just let it go. Yeah, yeah, we're going to let that one go. OK. <laughs> so the answer is, what about memory fragmentation? Well, if, if, if that's observable on your system, then you're going to have to work really hard to get a strong exception guarantee. And then the no, no exception guarantee is, is uh, uh, no exceptions, that, that nothing gets thrown, right? Or is it no, nothing gets thrown, or nothing escapes the operation? Uh, 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 There's no observable difference. There's no observable difference. There we go. So, yep. Okay, so there's this underlying notion that's kind of buried in those three things. And that's that what happens when an exception is thrown is we need to fix up mutating state when we're propagating an exception. Okay, that's a pretty brilliant insight, right? The exception guarantees are about what happens to mutable state. That's what they're about. Operations that do not mutate state can propagate errors directly. If you don't mutate state, you obey the strong exception guarantee by definition. Don't you obey the no fool guarantee? No. You can, you can have a read operation that can still, still throw an exception. OK. What's that? No. Doesn't have to. <laughs> OK. No, you, you try to read a file, the file's gone. That might throw. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. 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 So it's a little stronger than just fixing up mutations. It's really about class invariance. So the, what the guarantee tells us is that we, what we need to consider when an exception is thrown is operations where invariants are temporarily broken. Okay, where does that happen? That happens sometimes in member functions where we have private access mm -hmm. to the class. Okay. So now when we're looking at a piece of code to see is it exception safe, when we go back to me looking at, at HPSTL, Anything that's not modifying one of these things, I don't have to look at it. Okay. Sorry, that I, I hate. To, this is a maybe a technicality, but exception safe. Yes. Means that that it follows the specification that it gives for what happens when exceptions occur, right? Yes. So part of that means that if you say you're no except, you don't throw. Correct. Okay. So just the, fact, just the fact that you, you uh, uh, and now I'm. OK. Well, just the fact that you say no excess doesn't imply you. you no, that's not what I'm saying. OK. I, there was something that, I'm sorry. There's something you lost it. That this addresses. OK. Now, now you lost it. OK. I apologize. OK. We'll let that one go. OK, so if I were looking at vector, I, we need to consider these mutating operations. And I'm lying a little bit, right? I, for the most part, I could ignore those other operations. With the exception of the constructors, they're a little bit of an exception. What I have to make sure is that when I'm constructing to satisfy the system invariance that I may, and, and to satisfy uh, 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 just the requirements on constructors, that I need to be able to destruct. Right? If I get partially constructed and an exception is thrown, I need to go back and clean everything up but I'm not restoring the, the class invariants because the class invariants were never established. Okay. okay. Now, now I remember what it was. So, so what you said was, if you just look at your mutating operations and, yes. uh, and you ensure that they restore the invariants, then they're exception safe. And there's one other element, which is anything you said wasn't going to throw, it better not throw. And you have to, you have to <laughs> verify that. Yes. So Dave's comment was, you also have to make sure that anything you said wasn't going to throw doesn't actually throw. OK. So OK. So we also don't have to worry about, we can have a mutating function, which is a non-basis operation. We don't have to worry about exceptions in this. What's a non-basis operation? Well, 
a basis operation is one that requires the private access to your class. I can still have a member function, which although it's allowed to access the thing, doesn't. So if I'm looking at my vector and I've got a resize operation, which is written entirely in terms of, of the public interface, this piece of code as is, is exception safe. Okay, so. Right, provided it's documentation, which the basic guarantee is assumed in, in STL. So provided it doesn't give more than that. So a race could technically throw, but not in this case, because if you're erasing at the end of a vector, it won't throw. But we could throw making this copy. We could throw on this reserve. We could throw on any one of those pushbacks. And we're fine. OK, that's OK. Question up here? No, it's a basic exception guarantee. Oh, it's about meeting the contract that you've given. Yes, and it's about meeting. Everything the gives the basic guarantee by implication. Right. By, okay. Right. You know, it's ground rules. You can't break invariance. So. so the deal here is, so long as all of these operations are themselves exception safe, then it's not possible for me to violate the class invariance because I'm only look going through the public external interface. Okay. So therefore, by definition. I satisfy the basic exception guarantee. That's um, so this is John. Um, yes. Sorry. Somebody else was first. Oh. This is uh, illustrating the transitivity of safety. This is illustrating the, well, no, this is not the transitivity of safety. Right, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I thought you would have gotten to this point already, but okay. safety and exception safety isn't safety. Yeah, we, and we will get to that. OK. Apologies. Um, so. so my question was, did you check what guarantees are offered by the standard? Uh, uh, did I check what guarantees were offered by the standard uh, for resize? Um, yeah. No, I did not. Well, then we don't know yet that this is exception safe. That is true. Because the standard could say this needs to satisfy the strong exception guarantee. Good point. Thank you, Dave. OK. But assuming the basic exception guarantee, this is exception correct. Yes? Uh, the standard cannot guarantee the strong It does in many places. Well, no, 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 no. There are many operations that are documented to specify this run. Yeah, but. Yeah, so sometimes you can. Well, it doesn't tell us that it satisfies the contract. It still satisfies the basic exception guarantee. <laughs> What's that? It doesn't tell us that it, that it, it satisfies the C++ standard contract. But yeah, this code in isolation satisfies. The is you do what you say. Is you do what you say. This is not safety. Take, OK, we're, 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 ta we're going to talk about exception correctness here, because exception safety, we'll see in a moment, doesn't match our safety definition here. What's that? Yes, so this could be conditionally uh, a strong. Yep. And if we looked at the standard, this could actually, yeah? OK, well, so I picked a bad example because I was trying to pick something that I could implement purely in terms of external operations and satisfy the basic exception guarantee. Yeah, so put a comment up here that says, uh, uh, this is my vector, and this satisfies the basic exception guarantee. And we're done. OK. So we have to fix invariance when we're propagating an exception. Okay. Invariance should only be broken inside member functions with private access. You want to keep your basis small to narrow the impact of exceptions. Okay. 
So here's a little example. This is the zip vector that came up, came up before. Okay. So we've got this. We state our invariant. Our invariant is that v0 size is equal to v1 size. We've got our pushback operation. What happens if that, that second pushback throws? Is this exception safe? Not. No. No. We would violate our stated invariant right there. Okay. So we can fix it. We can rewrite the code like this. Okay. So we've got to do the try catch. We do the pop back. Okay. Okay. Now we could document pushback to say this obeys. Crap. I think we were all reading it as if it's. Yeah. V0. Thank you, Dave. You can tell how well I tested the code on my slides. Um, uh, yeah, so pretend that that's V0. OK. And, and so now we're going to satisfy the strong exception guarantee. And so we could document it as such. As long as pushback. As long as popback doesn't throw. Yeah, which is guaranteed not to. OK. Yes. Right. So you need to have operations that don't throw so that you can fix things up after acceptance of that. Okay. Okay. Post conditions. The questions here, Dave, are completely killing where this talk is going. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I didn't tell you. I know. Dave, Dave told me, don't give this talk. Nobody will get it. I'm like, oh, OK. No, I'm like, everybody's smart. We, we all got it. So, so remember, we, we had this statement before. OK? We gave this definition of a post condition. A post condition is an assertion that must be true after an operation. And we said, unless there's an error, but that's not sufficient. We have to say what the deal is after the error. Well, the exception guarantees tell us what to say, which it says, Unless there's an error, or if there's an error, then the invariants are still satisfied, but the state is otherwise unspecified. That's what the basic exception guarantee means. Okay? If we, we satisfy our post conditions, unless then there's an error, but if there's an, an error, the invariants are satisfied. Okay? But, uns, but, but potentially unspecified. Okay? So the basic guarantee falls out. Um, what, what did that say? I don't even know what that of sentence all, means. It falls out of all the documentation of your system. Oh, uh, of your system, yes. It says what's allowed to happen, what has to work. And the basic guarantee says just because an exception was thrown, that doesn't give you permission to violate any of those other promises you've made. OK. OK. Now keep in mind that really, I mean, Post conditions need to cover everything that happens. We kind of carved out errors, so we have to say something on errors. So there's an alternative view that says, says the error and this post condition is part of our state. But that's not particularly useful, because then if we say, well, if we throw an error during sort, what's the post condition? Please tell me about the state of the sequence with sort. It's easier to just say, say it's it's OK. It satisfies the invariance. It's unspecified. I'm not going to tell you what order the elements are in now or if all the elements are still there. OK. So the basic and strong exception guarantees are statements about correctness. Right? Fundamentally, these are statements about correctness. OK. So really, the title of Dave's talk should have been Exception cor correctness in generic components. Okay. So safety is about the consequences of violating preconditions. Guarantees only hold when preconditions are satisfied. Okay. The basic and strong exception, exception guarantees are not transitive properties. Right? They're statements of correctness. Just because I have, have two vectors and my two vectors Provide a basic exception guarantee doesn't mean that I can write my zip vector and that that just automatically satisfies the basic exception guarantee. Okay. Dave put this in here. It is safe in the sense that it's not allowed to crash, but its output may be un unpredicted. What he's talking about is the fact that all the values are unspecified. Okay. 
so that you still have to satisfy the invariance. So in that sense, it's safe. Okay? But there's a, there's a little bit of a difference there. So I started this talk saying this is exception handling the other way around. So let's take a look at what I mean by the other way around. So this is really top down versus bottom up. Okay? So Hoare logic, which I didn't go into any, any details on, but that's the idea of looking at the pre and post conditions of individual operations and then seeing how those match to build up a larger system. That's a bottom up series of reasoning about code. If you look at like the Clang static analyzer, which will tell you like, oh, hey, you dereference null here, and here's the big long path, that's doing whore logic, okay? Uh, design by contract is a top down approach, okay? I'm going to write a description of my routine on the outside, my specification, and then I'm going to prove that my operation actually satisfies what I wrote down. Okay, so instead of bottom up, I'm doing it top down. As developers, really, you're flipping back and forth. You're going between the two, right? You're doing some top down, some bottom up. Oh crap, I'm stuck. Work it from the other side a little bit until you figure out what your system's supposed to do. So. In generic programming, we have this notion of lifting. What lifting is, is finding commonalities bottom up across a set of components. Okay? I've got uh, sort strings, sort integers, sort whatever. I go and I look at those components and I say, say what's the commonality in here? What's, what's, what's the rules? Can I, can I discern that there's just this generalized sort operation? Okay? That's the process of lifting. So what's the top-down generic equivalent of lifting? Right? Well, that's what I call the other way around. I don't have a name. Okay? But the idea is to find common requirements of, of <coughs> callers and common models. Okay? What's, a, what's a model if we say, um, uh, 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 we've got sort, and sort takes an iterator. A pointer is a model of an iterator. Okay. So what are the requirements of exception handling? Or I'm sorry, what are requirements? Requirements are a generalization of preconditions. But they also include operations and their semantics and their dependent types. Right? So it's kind of C++ concepts plus preconditions equal requirements. In non-generic code, all the same requirements exist. They just tend to be implied by the type, which is why we tend to just talk about the preconditions and not the complete set of requirements. So concepts allow us to specify type requirements, some of that in documentation, what the actual preconditions are. Uh, 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 but they're still missing the value uh, requirements outside of the documentation. Guarantees. Guarantees are a generalization of post conditions. Right? So the basic exception guarantees are what is the post condition after an error has occurred. Right? And unlike typical post conditions, they may be conditionalized. <coughs> this is why they're a generalization. You could say this thing provides a strong exception guarantee so long as that thing supplies a strong exception guarantee. Okay? Okay, I, you know, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, the usual thing is, you know, so long as I've got a no-throw copy on my operation, then I can do this other operation without throwing type of thing. But if it does throw, then I might throw too. So let's take a look. Sort requires that value type iterator is movable. Okay, basic string T guarantees it is movable, right? Which really means that for all operations, the post condition of string T is that it's still within the domain of a movable operation. Therefore, an array of strings is sortable. Okay? So what we're concerned with here is what happens when we actually stop error propagation. We've been talking about we throw an error, we have to do some kind of fix up as that error's throwing down, but what can we do 
at the bottom, when we actually decide to stop, not throw again, not you know, pause and throw, but actually stop error propagation, right? What are our choices here? This actually gets it kind of right, okay? Now this is in a slightly different domain, but you really have three options. Abort, retry, ignore. <laughs> okay? So what do we mean? Well, we mean that if we're stopping error propagation, we're catching that exception, we have to satisfy that operation that's stopping the error conditions post conditions. Right? Because by definition, we're not rethrowing an error. So we must satisfy the post conditions, or we're done, and we're going to call terminate. Okay? So abort should really be called report and terminate. We do this when the program as a whole cannot satisfy the program's post conditions, right? A program is just a function. You call it at the beginning. You give it a set of arguments. It does its stuff. It has some result coming out. A program is just a function. You can get to the point in your program where you're like, there's nothing I can do. I'm done. Okay? So what are the requirements if we're going to call terminate on, on, on our mutable objects with invariants that that are temporarily broken, what do we require of those things? Nothing. Nothing. We're done. We're out. OK? So places where this might be appropriate would be things like failure during initializa initialization. There's just not enough memory on this machine to get started. Uh, there's uh, not the right uh, video card that I require, right? Things like that. We're just done. OK? A board is likely to happen up near main, somewhere up there. Sometimes it's, it's above main in the sense that you throw an exception and you never catch it. That's another way to terminate, right? Just let it go right off the top. Retry. What do we mean by retry? Well, we could retry the operation using the same or a different approach to satisfy the contract. If we're successful on the retry, we satisfy the contract we return. If we're unsuccessful on the retry, then we're back to throwing, throwing an exception and, and letting it continue to propagate. Okay. This gets a ridiculous amount of attention in the literature, and it's actually very rare. It's very rare to come up with a good example of retry. Okay, the canonical example is usually like, oh, if I'm making a network call and it doesn't answer, then I'll back off and try again type of thing. And uh, 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 usually you're handling that in a different way altogether than throwing exceptions on, on those things and doing a retry. There just aren't very many good examples. Dave? Yeah. We're going to get, get to that, right? So we said that, or we resume the error propagation. So the requirements are that we need to discard whatever junk we're hanging on to, OK, so that we can continue, right? And usually that means getting a strong exception guarantee. Do you have a question, Lisa? Uh, wouldn't, in your taxonomy, wouldn't any use of the strategy pattern call on your retry? Um, the question was, wouldn't any, any use of a strategy pattern fall under retry? Maybe. The, the issue there, Dave and I were talking about that, it's, it's very difficult if you're trying to do, like uh, my example was introsort that I had on the slide for a little while and Dave, and Dave objected. So the idea with introsort, which is what STD sort is typically implemented in, is you have a post condition and your post condition says that the complexity of this operation is, is no worse than n log n. So, so what intersort does is it starts out as a quick sort, okay? And quick sort usually will end up a little faster. Well, it, it will be n log n, but it, it, it uh, 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 has a low constant overhead, so it's a good first approach. But it can go quadratic if you pick bad pivot points, okay? And so what happens with intersort is intersort starts with a, with a quick sort, and then if it detects that it's not satisfying the complexity guarantee, it switches strategies and goes to um, uh, a heap sort, 
Okay, and a heap sort has a higher constant factor k, but is guaranteed to be n log n, and therefore quick sort guarantees that it meets, or, or std sort, intra sort, guarantees that it meets that complexity requirement. The reason why that's not, not considered an error in the middle is, is we're not really discarding work, we're monitoring the things, and we're picking up where we were and just continuing, just going a different direction. So it's not really a good example in this case. Yeah. Yeah. So the question was, how do you detect that you're going quadratic? And really what you're doing is you're detecting that you're exceeding n log n by counting recursion levels. Okay. So this may be appropriate for some I.O. operations or some memory management operations where you might want to say, oh, I threw an error because I was out of memory, so I'm going to dump a cache and retry that operation? Maybe. So usually these things are best done at the, near the point of failure. Okay. So that means those retry operations are up there in our tree or down there in our tree. Right, right, right. What Dave is saying is usually retry. I can just wrap up with the failing operation and treat that as one package, which, which encapsulates that whole thing. And now that thing as a whole is just either succeeding or failing, throwing an error. OK, so the last case is ignore. And we really don't want to ignore errors. Uh, uh, but what we mean is report and continue. So what are the requirements here? Well, they're the same requirements. We need to discard incomplete work, get back to some stable state, keep going. These are often implemented as a transactional operation, which means typically you're providing the strong exception guarantee, or it might be something very close to a strong exception guarantee. Right? You might not care that uh, uh, objects are exactly in the same position, okay, but that they have the same value, for example, things of that nature. So, uh, yeah, so usually the strong exception guarantee. Um, uh, 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 this tends to be appropriate for sequenced or optional operations. So kind of canonical examples. I'm copying a whole bunch of files. And what I want to say is I'm going to copy every file that I can that's not already you know, opened and locked something else. If it is open and locked, I'm going to report that as my output, skip it, go on to the next file. I'm using Photoshop. I do something. It says there wasn't enough memory to complete that massive thing you just tried to do. I'm now back in the, in the main loop. My document is back in the same state it was before, and I can do the next operation. So how would you classify something like this? So I'm doing a transaction on a database, and if it failed, uh, the logical state of the database is, is restored, but let's say there is a chunk of disk space that is unusable. So I, I have a gap. In my so you have a gap. That's why I mean it's strong exception guarantee ish. It might not actually be a strong exception guarantee. It's transactional of some form. Is that observable, is that observable too in your system? Not through the UI. I mean, you can, <laughs> you can measure the length of the file and notice that it grew. Yeah. So, yeah. But, uh, but not through the UI. I correctly jump over when I traverse. You know, all of that is handled. But I have to basically leave a black hole. Of okay. So when you when you talk about the exception guarantees and observable results, you have to choose what level of observability is significant. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and that's just like that's just like choosing what your understanding what your value is. You know, the same as in my talk. You know, that's for the the author of the system to you know nail down what is the meaning. Yes. Logical, uh, it's a logical, logical. yes. Yeah, the state of the universe has changed, but the logical state. <laughs> but the logical yeah. state, however you define the logical state, has yeah. remained the same. And, and what, you know, what you're actually going to observe is the question, not, not what you could observe with some theoretical you know, program. Right. right, right, right. If your program depends on something else not changing, then it's not the strong exception right, guarantee. Right, right. Okay. 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 Okay? So, yeah. 
OK, so retry, as with a board, is usually up near main, right? Right, right. You usually have, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, ignore, as with a board, is usually up near main, right? So this propagates all the way up. Um, uh, 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 and you say, OK, discard that thing and, and start on the next thing. OK, so what do we mean in these things when we say discard incomplete work? Well, Dave had this comment in his paper. He said, the options for recovery in this case are limited, either destruction or resetting the component to some no state before further use. OK, Those, that's what we're meaning by discarding complete work. So what are our requirements of exceptions? Well, as I said, we can phrase this. An object which is mute, being mutated when an exception is thrown must leave the object in a state within the domain of destruction. It needs to be destructible. We need to be able to destruct this operation. And within the domain of the left-hand side of assignment. Okay. Huh. These are exactly the terms that we used for the requirements of a pointer that's in an invalid state. It looks an awful lot like an object in a move from state. So the object should also be in the domain of any operation which does not read the object. Right? Why don't we want to read the object? Because if we only satisfied the basic exception guarantee, which is what we're talking about here, then, then uh, uh, because we're talking base level requirements, right? What's the, the Basic exception guarantees are the minimum requirements. These are our minimum requirements. So the object should domain in any of the operation which does not read the object, for example, vector clear. Right? That's fine. That's equivalent of assigning to the thing. OK. okay. So these are our requirements. The exception guarantees are not requirements. They're guarantees. The implied requirement is satisfies Class invariance satisfies invariance as a whole, is what's actually stated. But that doesn't actually tell you anything unless there's a requirement that some operations have no preconditions, right? In a general sense, if I have something that's supplying the, the exception guarantee and it throws an exception and I catch, I need to know what I can do with that object. What am I guaranteed to do with that object? in general for any object. This is what we're trying to look at, right? We're trying to generalize this process. Could I destruct it? I don't know. I can't always destruct a standard thread, say, if it hasn't joined, OK? Uh, uh, could I copy it somewhere? Could I compare it for quality? A pointer in an, in an unspecified state, I cannot, OK? A pointer in a valid and unspecified state could be invalid, <laughs> right? Valid in the standard there has two different meanings. So, but a pointer satisfying its invariance could be invalid. We saw that. So how do we reconcile this with invariance? Well, we'll call the class of invariance in the absence of exceptions the desired invariance. This is what we want our class to be able to hold, OK? The weaker invariance of only destructible and assignable to, right? A weaker set of invariants we're going to call as invalid. That's our invalid state of the object, like an invalid pointer. We can trivially weaken our class invariance to include this state. Okay? Our class invariants become invalid or desired invariants. Now, just like with a pointer, I can't actually write this function. I can't test anything. There's nothing I can observe. But I can state my invariance like that. And then I have to go add a precondition to all the non-destruction and assignment operations that says I'm valid and dot, dot, dot. Whatever preconditions, Whatever preconditions were there. OK, so the dot, dot, dot is the existing preconditions on that function. OK? OK, so see that transformation? So, so with this transformation, we're still completely logically consistent with the basic exception guarantees. OK. So why is this nice? Destructible and assignable tend to be transitive operations, right? What is destruction? If all, if you're, all of your parts are destructible, then you're destructible. Equal default. 
If all of your parts are assignable, then you're assignable, equal to fault. Okay. So. So tend to be. Well, no, I mean, the definition of assignable is really assign all the parts. Yeah, you could have side effects pointing out something else. Don't do that. <laughs> to assign an object, assign all the parts. OK, yeah, I didn't go through all the definitions of regular and what assignable means and what copy means, but you can go look those up. If we define the class invariance and preconditions of its operations to include invalid, OK? Without if, so. This statement, if we define the class invariance and preconditions of its operations to include invalid, as we just said we were going to do, then without doing anything else in, in our code to account for exceptions, a class using equal default for destruction and assignment can be exception safe. OK, everybody follow? And further, if you're for other cases, Right, where you, you have your own destructor, you have your own assignment operator, you need to do some complex things. Ensuring destructibility and assignable too in cases where the default implementation are insufficient is often simpler to reason about in the case of an exception. Okay? And in fact, frequently you can package your parts up so that they do this. So like maybe instead of having a T star in your code, you have a unique pointer and now you stop worrying about exceptions. There's a relationship here to move. So any function operation of the form x equals f of x, that's a pure function, okay, can be expressed as a mutating operation a of x. Okay, just one or the other forms might be more efficient. That's why we have mutating operations. That's why Dimitri and Dave are talking about val language and we're not talking about functional programming languages is because we want efficiency. Okay. Such a thing can also be expressed as a consuming operation g equal or x equals g of move of x. Right? Okay, everybody following? If G throws an exception, X is in a moved from state. It just is. The required post conditions after an error are identical to those of a move from object. I've got a proposal P2345 for the standard committee to actually fix the requirements of a move from object. So I'm talking about the fixed requirements that are identical. Class invariance and post conditions. We have to revisit this a little bit, okay? A class invariant is a post condition. We said that before. A post condition is, is an assertion that must be true just after an operation, unless there is an error. Instead of saying, then it satisfies the invariance, now we're gonna say, then the result may be invalid, okay? So what does this allow us to do? We'll go back to our zip vector case here, okay? Now, if we say our invariant is invalid or the sizes are equal, okay? And a precondition, I add the valid term here, and I do the push, two pushbacks. Now this code is exception safe under Dave's definition, okay? It satisfies the basic exception guarantees. We satisfy our invariance. We also satisfy the requirements of the caller. And we don't need to try catch. We're done. Okay? We can even simplify things a little bit by really talking about the desired invariant and saying our invariant is that the sizes are, are equal, but we may be invalid by exception. And you could tack on or move. What's that? You could say, may be invalid by exception or move. Okay. Correct exception handling has zero impact on most code. Okay. It really, really does. Right? right? The number of places in my code when I'm writing code where I'm thinking about exceptions, now part of that is just that I've been doing this for 30 years and so it's very internalized, but the amount of brain cycles that I have to devote to is my code exception safe or not is close to zero. Okay. 
Okay, what I try to do is I package my things up using whole part relationships, which is what Dave was talking about and Dimitri was talking about, and then I'm done. I stop worrying about it. It just works. Everybody follow? Okay, so all of this, oh, I want stood expected, I want basic outcomes so that I can see the flow of my exceptions. That's a lot of flow through deep stacks. I don't want my code mucked up with monadic chaining of error handling through 50 layers of my stack, right? The basic C++ exception handling model, for the most part, is the correct exception handling model. Now that's the high point. Kate Gregory says you should, oh, how am I doing on time? I'm probably over time. You're over. I'm over, okay. Um, so so Kate Gregory says that this is usually the, uh, uh, you know, you want to end a talk on a high note. So this is the end of the talk on a high note. People want me to continue? <laughs> okay. So we need to talk about the disadvantages. <laughs> okay. Stronger preconditions, which is what we have here, right? By throwing this invalid state into here, we, we, on all of our operations, we had to add, we had to strengthen our preconditions and say, say that this operation, a precondition is that we're in a valid state. And we can't express that valid state just like we couldn't in, in a pointer. There's nothing we can do to check it. In an unsafe language like C++, may result in more unsafe operations, okay? So now the unsafe operations are things that were wrong to begin with because that's the definition of safety, okay? So the difference there is do you have unspecified objects? Sorry, I just need to keep you honest. Yes. Unsafe operations weren't things that were wrong. The unsafe operations were things that were unsafe because they 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 were it's not that the unsafe operations were things that were wrong, it's that unsafe operations have additional consequences, okay, when we call them incorrectly, right? So, so we have potentially kill the family dog consequences if we have bugs in our code, okay? So this is kind of anti-safety. Anti, anti There's trade-offs there in that reason about exception handling and getting it correct and putting the tries and catches in the right place and maintaining your desired invariance, you can also get that wrong. And I guarantee you, not a lot of your code in there is well tested. So there's a balance. Okay. The other thing nobody asked about is what about shared state? Well, as Dave and Dimitri said, correct mutation requires exclusivity, right? right. It just does. So that means everything within the program is part of some whole. And if you've got shared state floating around your program and you're mutating it and an exception can get thrown, you need to reason about the whole of that shared state to figure out what the correct thing to do is. Okay. And this is regardless of which approach to exception handling we're taking you have to understand the implicit structure as a whole. Now, you might be able to get a little bit away with it because you satisfied the invariance. It's an unspecified value. Your program is, is uh, 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 maybe you left this thing in a garbage state somewhere and you happen to work, Titus uh, uh, Winter's line, okay? But to get the code correct, you have to understand the system as a whole. There's a question back here. <laughs> uh, probably not the whole operating system memory. It, it's, the, it's the logical structure that's, that's all the things that are touching the shared state that is now in an unspecified or even a strong exception guarantee. I didn't cover this, but the, unfortunately the strong exception guarantee is not transitive. It's not a transitive operation. Oh, I did cover that, so. I don't understand Well, I mean, if I've got a global variable, and I'm mutating it and an exception happens, 
I could say put it back to the state it was in, strong exception guarantee, but I don't know whether or not that's sufficient to keep the invariance in my whole application. Maybe there was another global variable that has to be the same size as this one, right, right, and I changed one and not the other. I mean, really, you would be, you would want to transactionally apply the reverse operation of whatever you did. All the way down to yes. some level. Yes. Okay. And that scope is somewhere between the calling scope of where the exception was thrown and everything that's happened in the application prior. Yeah. Good luck. Right. right, so so you can't reason about shared state locally. So the one thing is, is if what you're trying to do is, is uh, uh, ignore, right, report and continue, so you're catching close to main to stop the, the error, error propagation, you might be already under all the shared state, even though you had the shared state that was in invalid states, you destructed it all, so you satisfied my definition of the basic guarantee, even if you couldn't satisfy Dave's, maybe, okay? Or close to main, you might have a shot at identifying roots. Now you're down to, oh, okay, I've got five global variables I need to figure out, okay? So you might have a shot, right? Be able to identify the roots. Go on, Dave. And if you go back to um, my inheritance is the base class of evil talk from a bazillion years ago, um, uh, in there I show building up kind of a basic undo mechanism on copy on write. And that's the way Photoshop works. It's like, okay, make a logical copy of the document, do the modifications, an exception gets thrown, throw that out, you're back to where you were. Right? <coughs> So I said C++ exceptions are, are the basic models correct, but that's not to say they're perfect, right? Part of the problems is that exceptions on is by the default, is, is by default, okay? The problem with that is that means even though we talk about zero cost exceptions, they're not completely zero cost, and they also have exception handling tables, and those have weights. And that means that we're paying uh, for a bunch of logical code paths in our code, that for the most part are probably never going to get taken. Wait, Sean, I'm sorry. Yeah? Do you, when you say exceptions on is the default, I think what you mean is this function could throw is the default, not uh, the yes. compiler. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, yeah, that the compiler know. option isn't standard. This is, we're talking about standard C++, not turning exceptions off. Yeah, what I mean by exceptions are the default is not that they're on in your compiler by the default. I mean that if I don't say anything on a function, it can throw, okay? And that means that I can't really optimize that code path unless I'm doing LTO, maybe, and the linker has enough visibility on what's going on above that to be able to determine it won't actually throw. So operator new throws and is replaceable. And not just replaceable, but it's typically provided by your system, which means it's a dynamically linked library, which means it's replaceable in the field. The problem with that is that the default operator new that you're given, if you don't replace it, will probably never throw, especially if you're programming on PCs or in your large systems, because you're in 64-bit address space. You can allocate as much memory as you want. It's just assigning address space to you. It's not actually taking any physical RAM. There's a whole VM system there. When you will actually run out of memory is when you go to touch a page of memory to write it, and there's no disk space left to page in. That's when you run out of memory on most systems. 
but because it's replaceable and defined to be throwable, according to the standard, well, even if you're running on an operating system where we know it can't throw, it could get it could throw, and so we need to have all the exception tables and stuff in place, and we can't optimize them away, and LTO, LTO won't even help you. Maybe you could get a flag to a link time optimizer that would say, say no, I'm not going to do that. Just assume memory management never throws. Okay. Reliance on RTTI and inheritance is, is a... A similar problem. This is really with a standard library, not with the exception handling mechanism itself, but we have std exceptions and a whole hierarchy of exceptions underneath that. And in order to catch exceptions, you're relying on, on RTTI. And that means that you have RTTI tables, which include names of operations, which are her fairly heavy weight, and they're embedded in all of your exceptions. Yeah, and the language there, that problem. That's not the same problem. What's that? That's, 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 that part is the, is the poor language, but the fact that that exception handling in the standard relies on that means I can't escape it, okay? Yes. And, and because all of this RTTI information is not opt-in, okay, it means I have to have it turned on in my compiler to use exception handling, and then it means I have all RTTI information for all of my classes that the compiler and optimizer doesn't have enough visibility into to optimize away. These are all static tables, maybe they never get loaded, but it's a cost. So there's no guarantee of no accept move for standard components. And that's partially because they didn't want to redefine the invariance of the standard components. And so you have things like if I'm moving a std list, if I'm using the Microsoft standard library, moving a std list or any of the node-based containers may throw an exception because it actually has to allocate the terminal node. Okay, And we couldn't optimize that out. And so now these things can't be moved. Well, that's a real problem when we're trying to get the strong exception guarantee. Okay? It means in order to get a strong exception guarantee on a std list, I need a unique pointer to a std list. I need one more level of indirection. And then ABI leakage, right? As much as people like to talk about, you know, C++, should we break the ABI or not? C++ doesn't have an ABI. It doesn't have any insulation around the ABI. If you're building DLLs and you're compiling them with uh, one compiler and compiling another one with another compiler, you've got a very slim chance of that working unless you're absolutely super careful in how you define those things. But if you're building DLLs, what happens in industry, like Photoshop has a plug-in model. Plugins could be built with C++. How does that work? Well, the plugin vendor has to hide all of their symbols within the DLL to encapsulate it. But if you're running on Windows, RTTI is done by name, lookup, not by symbol, which means all of the names for RTTI within that library leak. Okay? Exceptions are things that aren't documented in the interface boundaries, and so, so I can throw an exception across an interface boundary, and that's leak, right? That's leaking some data type that I should not be able to see, and maybe the symbols for it are completely hidden. Okay, well, so that's a problem. It can, it can cause ODR. Failure to catch exceptions because you have a name collision and, and yeah. you decided to identify the other type. Yes. So I don't know how many times at Adobe, I'm being told to wrap it up here, I don't know how many times at Adobe I will see somebody say, I have this three lines of code that's just like throw, throw std logic error, catch std logic error, and I can't. And I'm like, you've got a DLL somewhere in your environment that's either exposing a different, a, a different standard error or hiding it, okay? So that's it. So I'm wrapped up.